The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. So my name is Robert Ristroff. I work for Four Kitchens from Austin, Texas. Um, I have a lot of experience in finding bugs, most of them my own, um, not just in Drupal, but in lots of other systems. Uh, I accumulated a good decade of programming and debugging my own problems uh, before getting into Drupal. Um, these slides are, I already put them online. If you go to the Drupal Camp Charlotte website, um, and just find my session, they're attached there. If uh, I put both the PDF and the ODP, and um, if you want to borrow some of these slides for your own presentations, that's cool. If you want to email me for the source of anything in them or challenge me on any point in them, that's fine too. Um, so here's, here's roughly what I want to cover in this talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about why debugging is important and why like, it's kind of worthy of your attention as like, a separate subject from just development and so on. And then, um, and then I'm going to kind of, uh, kind of repeatedly beat this point that you can follow this sort of process of debugging, of sort of dividing and conquering by thinking up little tests that, and thinking ahead of time when you, when you imagine the test, like, uh, what the two, what different results would mean, and then looking for, doing the test, looking for the results, and then sort of making sure you undo anything you did to your environment, like kind of start clean and do another test. And then particularly if you sort of try to divide and conquer, so you narrow down where the bug may be. Um, and that's, that's kind of roughly what uh, they sometimes put in high school science textbooks and so on as the scientific method which is um, kind of where I stole the terminology from with hypothesize and test repeat and so on. And then I'm going to run through sort of like some uh, initial quick things to check, sort of like debugging tips. I find that this is less useful, like the, the, the ideas of well, what are the common bugs tends to change over time. Um, and so just like memorizing the 10 most common bugs doesn't like help you very, as much as uh, you might hope. This is a quote that is from Maurice Wilkes, who was one of the first people to do any stored program computing at all. He was working on machines that had been used to break German codes in um, World War II that were then sort of made into paper tape based computers. And he would punch these tapes in his office and have to run down this long set of stairs to the basement where the machine was. And in uh, one of his autobiographies, I think he has more than one, he says, as soon as we started programming, we found to our surprise it wasn't as easy to get programs right as we had thought. Debugging had to be discovered. I can remember the exact instant when I realized that a large part of my life from then on was going to be spent in finding mistakes in my own pro programs. And I think that if you could like, set up one of those little things where you like, take a screenshot of your computer every five minutes and then review it at the end of the day, or watch yourself on a videotape and look at what you actually do, you actually spend a lot of, of your time, well, you probably find you spend a lot more of your time doing stuff that is project management type stuff than you really believe. But out of development and stuff, you spend a lot of your time just sort of figuring something out and narrowing it down and, and, and essentially debugging something. And then once you get in where you sort of know what you're developing and writing, that process is often much more, much more painless compared to debugging. I think if you could sort of watch yourself for a week, you'd realize that I spend a lot of my time debugging. If I was twice as good at it, I'd get a lot of hours back. Um, and I'd like to sort of emphasize like what I mean by debugging. A lot of times if you look up like guides to debugging or whatever, they tell you things like use an IDE that has syntax highlighting and things like that. Um, and, I, and I don't mean just sort of better development practices. Um, and I, I don't mean that, oh, we made the website and the customer came back and said, well, actually, we want this page to be view, viewable by anonymous users. 
That's just the customer changing things, or you getting a clearer specification and making changes. All right. And even like once you track down a bug and you know what it is, when you, when you fix it, sort of that last step, when you fix the bug, that's more just ordinary development. That's like sort of a, it's a different mental process. But there's this very specific mental process you go through where you have an idea of what this code should do and where, what colors and pixels it should put up on your screen. And it's not doing that. And you look at the code and you sort of adjust your model into the model of the code running in your head until the model of the code running in the head and on your computer kind of match. And you say, oh, I understand why it did that now. And that process of, of getting this model to align is, is, is what I think of as debugging. And um, it, is, it is like kind of a separate mental groove. It really is. And if you realize that it's a mental, mental groove and just think about it that way, you, you'll naturally get, get much better at it just by paying attention to it. Um, and, uh, and, and there's a few people who are sort of naturally very good at it. If you've ever been on a big team of programmers, sometimes there's kind of one guy who is the debugging guy because um, for, for whatever reason, you know, he can find these, these little quirks. Um, but, uh, but I think those people are very few, but I also think that anybody who sort of pays attention to it can easily become, you know, 10 times they are nat as, as good as they are naturally. Like, it, it is something you can learn. Um, and one thing I'd like to, I kind of separate out debugging from what you might call separately as troubleshooting, right? I say, you know, remember, I would advise you to remember that, that bugs are actually errors that somebody made. And in my case, it's almost always me, because I'm the, I'm the one, you know, making these things or trying to hook together two modules that shouldn't hook together and that kind of stuff. Um, and remember that, that bugs aren't something like a cosmic ray that came from outer space and changed a bit on the hard drive, and then you reloaded the operating system and it was fine. That falls under the category, in my mind, of troubleshooting, right? It's like something that just broke by itself. Bugs are, are mistakes, you know? They came out of my fingers and into the project. Um, I typed them in, and, and when, when you're debugging, if you kind of, at the end of the process, kind of make a, a mental practice of always thinking back, like, how did I do this? In my case, a lot of it's because I didn't really read everything about what this module or this piece of code was supposed to do, right? Um, even if it's as simple as that, then, then over time, you'll quit making those mistakes. Um, and you'll become much more productive. You'll probably still make mistakes, but they'll just be different and more interesting. <laughs> um, this, I think, is kind of a bit of programming lore. I like to have this slide in, uh, in there. This is a piece of notebook paper that's generally quoted as you know, the first bug. Um, it's a notebook paper from the, um, that's in the Computer Museum in Boston. It's from, uh, I think, the um, uh, ENIAC system. And um, it's an engineer's logbook. And so up near the top, it says 0800, uh, something started. Um, 10 o'clock, stopped something. And he has like some numbers, some notes. And then he has some, some words about relays failing. And then uh, at 11 o'clock, he says, started cosine tape. And then he says, started multi-adder test. And then at 15.45, at 3.45 PM, he says, relay 70 in panel F, moth in relay. And there's a yellowed ancient piece of scotch tape with a, um, a bug there. Underneath this line, it says, first actual case of bug being found, which um, is kind of interesting, because in terms of the history of the language, because he, he bothered to say first actual case of bug, that means they obviously must have been using the word bug to mean mistakes before that. And most people say it probably appeared sometime during World War II among people working on maybe complex mechanical systems like airplane engines or something. But no one actually knows like, when that bit of slang entered the lexicon. If, if any of you ever happened to see like, anything, any citation of early uses of bug, you know, I'd be interested in and hearing about that and putting a link in this presentation. So email me. Um, so getting into, um, getting into just the, 
the, the basic kind of loop type thing that I follow when, when um, debugging. There's sort of this initial phase where you sort of vacuum up all the information you can. You try to get a lot of background information. Um, you even try to pick up things like um, just the technical background and knowledge of the person who's telling you, is this a bug? Like, you know, are they, do they deal with this website all the time? Are they used to dealing with computers? You know, that kind of stuff. You kind of vacuum up all this information, log screenshots, et cetera, and you, you make a guess. And you know, your guess may be that, oh, when we rolled out the code last Friday, somehow someone turned off this feature, and that's why the about page is no longer there, or, or something like that. And then you, um, you make some sort of test and you get results. And so in that case, like your, your test may be, I'll go on my development environment, look to see if, the, if that if that feature is unchecked, right? If it is unchecked, I'm, I'm going to um, check it, um, reload, and see if the page appeared. And that's like a concrete test. And then, um, and, then you, um, and then you sort of refine it. Like if that didn't fix it, or the feature was there, but the page is still not there, then you have to kind of start again. But you've, you know, at each point through this, you sort of eliminate something. So there's like this big, vast space of problems. And like your test should, should, should be cutting off little chunks of it and whittling it down. And ideally, for you to get really efficient and good at being um, uh, a debugger, you want to sort of split it and cut off like huge chunks and, 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 and be able to narrow down much more quickly at the beginning. And it's similar to what people describe as a scientific method. And it's similar to the scientific method that it's um, kind of an art you can't really just give someone instructions on how to do it. You have to um, pay attention to what you're doing, observe yourself making mistakes, and, and kind of um, figure it out. But it definitely can be learned. There are definitely people who are very, very poor at it to start out. And, um, and people usually learn it from working with someone else who's very good. Um, uh, I think a typical kind of path is someone who's a relatively new to development, works on a team with someone who's much older, and they, um, and they kind of observe this person following this process, and they, they, they pick it up and get much better at it. And a key is sort of picking these hypotheses such that they're quick to test. You don't want to pick out a hypothesis that's like, I'm going to reload my operating system and the operating system and server and everything and see if it goes away, because it's unlikely to be the problem, and it takes a long time, right? Whereas a test that is, say, clear the cache, that and see if it's still there, um, that may also be very unlikely to be the problem, but it's really quick to run. So you may go ahead and do it first anyway, right? So you have this sort of evaluation, like how much information is this test going to give me versus how hard is it for me to run it? And there's, um, there's kind of just an art to that. Um, but that first stage, when you're sort of vacuuming up all the information, I think, uh, I think there's a lot of common things people miss. And um, depending on what your environment is and whether you're always working on the same website or you work in a, sh in a shop that's continually rolling out projects or whatever, you might want to even develop your own little checklist of like kind of things to, to remember to look at when you're vacuuming out problems. In, in my case, um, one of the common things that, that I overlook is a MySQL slow query log to see if um, a lot of the sites I work on, the problems end up being database related. And um, I seem to like forget that every couple of weeks. And then somebody will report a problem, and I'll do a lot of debugging before I think, oh, maybe you know, the database is causing it to time out or something like that. Um, and so there's, there's the Drupal watchdog, which normally on production should be sent to um, syslog or the vorlog messages file. And, and you, know, you should know about that and how to find it. And you know, if you don't have access to production, you should get your guys to set up uh, some type of cron job that copies the vorlog messages to where you can get it so you can check these things. Um, and these last two points uh, are actually kind of aimed at the people who may not be so much developers. But if you... Um, if you interact directly with customers and the people or clients or whoever the people are reporting problems are in your organization, like you're an account manager or whatever, 
and you may not be a developer at all, or you may be in a small organization where you're everything, but if you're that person who's talking to the initial reporter of problems, like you can you know, really earn your salary by getting good at, at collecting information. One of the things that, um, for, for example, one of the things you can do is, is teach people how to take a screenshot, like ask them, you know, what version of Windows are you on, XP, you know, and just Google XP screenshot and tell them how to s snap a screenshot. And sometimes you have to teach them how to attach it to an email and send it to you, depending on who you're working with. Because a screenshot of what they're seeing sometimes comes with, comes with a lot of extraneous information that they neglected to mention, like the fact that they're on a different computer that they've never used before, or, um, or you see the, in the URL uh, title that they're actually going to the staging machine because you gave a demo to them earlier and they still have that URL in there and that's why they're confused. Or all sorts of uh, things like that. Um, and if, if you just sort of teach your client and make sure they know how to take a screenshot, um, you know, it's, it's kind of impossible to add up how much money that might save you over a couple of months, but um, I'm pretty sure it pays off like 100 times in some of the projects I've worked on. And, uh, you know, I've worked with some project and account manager people who I'm pretty sure were like kind of the difference between a project that was having problems, completely failing, and ultimately being okay. Just because they kind of kept tabs on like, oh, this person is reporting that, but they're kind of always confused. I'm going to call them directly and just talk to them for a while. Or, or this person is reporting that. They're probably right. I'm going to go get a developer right now. We're going to read this email together and figure it out. And that sort of thing. Um, and the, ne the next step in the process, and you, you kind of have to do this in order to be able to start testing your hypotheses, is you need to be able to replicate the bug. Um, you, if you can't replicate the bug, then you're stuck in this, this area of making changes, pushing it out to live, and hoping people quit complaining. And that's, that's the worst case problem, and that's often what people get caught in with really weird performance bugs, is they don't know how to replicate the performance problem, and so, and so they kind of like make a few changes, they say oh, that should make things faster, and they wait to see if the complaints keep coming. And that's, that's usually, um, uh, it's usually pretty hard. And so normally, you know, what I do is I get the latest copy of, of the development, including the sites all files and the database, see if I can make it happen on, on my development machine. And as soon as, as soon as I can, I'm kind of like off to the races in debugging, because I can go through some process, get something to show up that doesn't fit my idea of what should be happening, and I can start looking into that. Um, sometimes you get bug reports where it's, it's not clear what is confusing the person, or it's something that's intermittent, or something like that. Um, and there are some sort of war story type um, bugs that you know, only happen every once in a while, or, or only after s something weird or unusual has happened, like a certain number of people have created new accounts, or something like that. And, and sort of the whole process of the whole thing is just figuring out how to replicate it. Often, often for those kind of bugs, like once you realize the exact series of steps to go through to replicate a bug, like you're, you're kind of, like that, that makes it all obvious and all of a sudden it's, it's done. It takes a few minutes just to figure out what's going on. Um, and, so, and so once you can replicate the bug, you can sort of do all the, the, the um, quick and easy uh, tests first, and um, you know probably most people in here are pretty familiar with them. But sometimes, uh, depending on what sort of work you do, it can be good to actually keep some sort of little list or something. I kind of put all these under the um, phrase "check the plug" from the you know IT support days, where they would always ask you, "Is your computer plugged in?" And um, you know it always felt irritating, but you know it probably occasionally saved them a lot of time. Um, you know, in, in a typical Drupal thing, we have a whole chain of, of caches that can be cleared and then retested, right? One thing I, I want to emphasize of that is usually if, well, often if clearing a cache, quote unquote, fixes the problem, it, you might not have solved it. You may think you have because you cleared the cache, 
but on on many Drupal setups, you know, there's something wrong going on and that the cache wasn't automatically cleared when something happened. And all that's going to happen is you're eventually going to get another bug report of the same thing when it when the caches get out of sync and invalid again. And so um, it's important to remember that just because you cleared the cache and it went away, um, you know, sometimes you have to stop and think, you know, why did that happen? Can I make it happen again? If I edit this node and then from another computer come in as anonymous, do I still see the wrong thing? You know, is there something deeper that needs to be fixed here as to why the cache was not right? Um, uh, and you know, checking things like the right version of the code is on the server, that like they're not deploying a different branch because of you know, some special circumstance. Um, one that uh, I used to kind of use a lot, I haven't used recently, is I would also have bugs that were in, 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 some, in some essence, they were summed up by there's, it's right in the database and wrong on the web page. And to kind of split where in the process something was going wrong, I would switch to the default theme in order to eliminate our custom theme as the source of something being hidden or covered up. And then I would know whether to focus on looking in, in theme code or uh, focus on Drupal configuration and Drupal code. Um, and, uh, and of course, you know, you can, another thing that happens on some of the sites is, is old versions of CSS or something may somehow not have been refreshed on their CDN system if you use uh, a CDN system. Um, kind of a, a kind of meta comment on, on all of these is notice that a lot of them deal with the fact that Drupal has accreted a lot of different caching systems and some of them are complicated. Um, and that's like one of the reasons why Drupal sites sometimes have bugs. Um, once you've kind of checked the things that are easy to check, um, it's usually a good idea not to like, you know, sort of keep your head down and keep plowing onward. Usually that, usually once you realize I've done everything that's a one minute check, that's usually a good point to sort of step away from the keyboard and, and think for a minute. And that's usually when I, um, I start doing some Google searches and, um, depending on the nature of the problem, I go on IRC and I go in, in Drupal support. Often, when I'm going into Drupal support and looking for a problem, I don't expect anyone to be able to solve it for me because you know, my problem is almost too complex to explain to them, right? They can't log into my code base and look at my custom module and things. But um, one of the good things that happens is in the process of talking about it on Drupal support, asking people if they've seen every, seen other things, they'll use different um, words to describe something, right? Um, like maybe I was using the word template and everybody else uses the word token for, for, for some particular thing. And, and once you see what, they're using, what the words they're using is, often that helps you Google search. It keeps you from looking for their arcane term for something when there's actually a more common term out there where you can find the result much, much more quickly. Um, one, one sort of portion of this is sometimes at this stage I start as like the next level of harder problems. I start, um, I start trying the dev version of different modules to see if the problem goes away. And at this point, uh, you really have to sort of focus on the sort of scientific hypothesis style of, of testing because you don't want to you don't want to try the dev version of modules unless you have a reason to suspect that the problem is in that module. And you also want to, once you've put the de development version down on there, done the update, and tested it, you want to undo that if that was not the problem. You don't want to let your development copy just sort of accrete a bunch of little changes that um, were like little experiments you did. Um, and are sort of causing your stuff to diverge more and more from the production system that has the problem and, uh, and just kind of confuse and hide the issue. <coughs> so if you're going to try the development version of something, you, you want to do it, you want to try it, and then you want to go back to the old version of the code, grab a copy of the database, and go back to that copy of the database and sort of undo the effects of that experiment. Um, uh, 
And of course, and this kind of goes hand in hand with the searching or, or, or whatever, um, you know, try to post wherever, if you find a good description of, of the problem somewhere that matches your searches, try to post there and describe your solution um, uh, when you're done. Um, this, is, uh, this is kind of a list of common problems. It's a little bit more oriented toward Drupal 6 because it's kind of old. But, um, but these are sort of in, in my mental list of, of common problems that I, that I run into. Um, and uh, and um, I think it's a good idea not to sort of use other people's lists of common problems. Your, the common problems you will run into are probably dependent on how you work and the types of sites you work on and so on. But I think it is good to sort of mentally keep a list of what the common problems are because you know, you really kind of feel bad when you spend half a day hunting down something and realize, oh, yeah, this is what I did last Friday afternoon too. You know, um, you, <laughs> you know so, um, uh, so, I, so I have a list of bullet points here. There's permissions on an input filter. Sometimes when you're getting like the user is not allowed to do something, it's not about permissions on the node, it's about permissions on the input filter that the node needs in order for you to be able to edit it. There's node access type related things, which are, all, which are like cache clearing things, and that if you have to rebuild that table, there's a reason why it wasn't rebuilt by itself correctly, and you still have to keep going, just because you found that one, in, that one thing you can do to undo it, you still have to figure out why it's happening. Um, and, uh, you know, permissions on um, files generated by the web server versus files generated by Drush and your version control system and so on are like a, a source of a lot of little, little, little tweaky things. Um, sometimes you can have content permissions and you, you think you should be able to do everything because you have the right node permissions, but there's actually permissions applying to specific fields. Um, the the cron-related cron semaphore Checking the cron semaphore um, variable and seeing if cron is like not finishing it or that kind of stuff is also related to a lot of stuff. Usually, with search, the search results not updating and things like that, or our feeds not updating. Um, one kind of uh, kind of global comment on this whole list, which I think does kind of apply to Drupal and even to just complex web si web systems in general or complex systems in general. Look at how many of these involve permissions of some type, you know, the node access, input filter permissions, file system permissions, content permissions, and so on. In general, big complex systems tend to have lots of different layers of permission type systems. And, and sometimes figuring out which is, what is blocking you at the right lay, layer is, is kind of a key. And that's sort of like a, a source of the complexity that can make um, things like Drupal or any other complex system uh, buggy. Um, and my main point on this slide is don't go looking for uncommon problems. <laughs> like if uh, some guy told you this long story about how he spent a week tracking down this problem that ended up to be you know, a missing semicolon in his custom module or something like that, and you have a bug the next day, don't go look through all your code looking for missing semicolons. <laughs> you know, start the debugging process, look through the normal things, make a guess as to what part of the system is causing this, you know, try to think of a test that would narrow it down to that, and, and go through that, that process. I think listening to other people's, you know, war stories about bugs is, is kind of instructive. It's kind of how you learn to debug. And, in, in, a, in a certain way. And I, I like to kind of collect those from, from people. If you, have any, if you have any good ones, maybe we can share some at the, at the end of this. Um, uh, but it's, it's not a good way to like, you know, use as a way to start finding whatever problem you're facing today. Um, it's, it's much better to kind of do your quick tests and then get into, you know, the thinking mode and like, you know, sort of the organized structural track down mode. Um, so I mean, a key part of doing these hypotheses is the test part, which is like being able to look into the system at a particular place. You know, this is the equivalent of like the scientist's instruments or microscope. This is like how you look into different things. 
And if you have better tools to look into different things, then you can do more, you know, little experiments and tests. Um, I tend to actually do a lot of debugging, though, without using special tools. Um, you know, I, I insert lines like these two in, uh, in various parts of the code, you know, printing out um, various variables or arrays, or dropping the same output into Watchdog if it's something that's not going to make it all the way out to the page, um, <clears throat> and that sort of thing. I think, um, I think in, in general that, you know, if you're going to make a profession out of developing, getting a good setup with things like xDebug and good debuggers and all those kinds of tools is, is very important. But it's, it's not going to, like, automatically mean you find bugs faster. You can, I mean, I've, I've traced through a whole page request in Drupal and, you know, watched a bug that I must have put in there at some point happen in front of my eyes and got to the end and seen the page print out and, you know, still been no wiser because I wasn't in the mode of sort of thinking about my model of what should be happening versus what, um, what was, was really happening. So um, uh, it's also the case that usually when you have someone complaining to you about a bug, they're kind of like checking on you every hour, asking if you fixed it yet, and that kind of thing. It's usually like a very inconvenient time to try to figure out how to set up xDebug and so on. So if you want to have good development tools, you want to think of xDebug as really as a development tool. You want to set up beforehand and know how to turn it on and off and, and, and use it and so on. When you're in the middle of debugging, don't, don't try to learn the new tool. That's like a new thing to debug. You know, focus on debugging. You can use all the standard things. Um, I like to make an analogy to... Um, to golfers, you know, they say the average person who's an amateur golfer, if you want to spend a few hundred dollars improving your score, and you have the choice of getting a couple of Saturday afternoon lessons from, from a professional or buying, you know, the most expensive carbon fiber clubs online or whatever, you'll generally improve your score a lot more by keeping your old crappy deemed clubs and just getting some really good lessons. Um, and similarly for debugging, if you, if you, most of us can get a lot further down the road just by thinking about what we're doing and being smart about it than we, we can by getting, you know, these fancy tools. It is true that if you have these tools, all other things being equal, you can go faster because you can run the page and check on results faster. And, and so you, you have a slightly more sophisticated way of peering into the system and, and, uh, and, and that does help. Um, but it's really more the overall kind of thought structure that's, that's going to really make the difference between, you can, between thrashing wildly and finding the problem. I mean, you can still spend days making random changes and praying, even if you have xDebug. Um, if, if, uh, if you're looking for kind of a development environment with like everything all kind of tweaked and put together a little bit, you might look into the Quick Start project. There's a, it's a drupal.org slash project slash quick start. There they have a link to a torrent file of a, um, of a virtual box that is, that is in Ubuntu kind of set up to run multiple Drupal instances for a, um, for a Drupal developer. And it has some little icons on the desktop to like, you know, start up a new test instance and you, you type in a name and it does everything for you. And it has xDebug and xHprof um, set up on it, and it has an, a nice IDE set up. Um, if you don't want to spend um, a lot of time, you know, looking in forums for the coolest Eclipse plugins and stuff like that, you might try looking at this. You know, it, it might get you, you know, where you want to be just for that. I know that there are some Drupal development shops that have sort of standardized on it. Like, everybody runs that. That's how they, that's how they work their code. Another part of inspecting is not just like looking at the state of variables and the code as it executes, but um, sort of comparing database states. <clears throat> and, um, uh, and this is tricky, because you can't just take two MySQL dumps and diff them and get very good results. I mean, you're, you're going to kind of have to know what you're looking for. Um, it's also important that when you're working, you, you have a starting point database copy that you know has the bug in it. And as you do each little experiment, you wipe out your database and you put that back and kind of start fresh. So you don't have 
all your little experiments growing like warts on this and, and the thing is getting more and more out of sync. So that you kind of start clean and try something else and start clean and try something else. And to really be able to do that, you, you kind of need a script that blows away your database or whatever. Or just a couple of commands in your history, maybe all separated by semicolons. So you can just do up arrow and find it, hit enter, and you're clean. You log in again and you keep going. Um, if you do things like, you know, use Drush to dump all the variables and pipe them to files and difference them and, and so on, that can be useful as long as you, you're kind of looking for a specific thing. You're going to say, hey, I wonder if there are more WYSIWYG filter variables set in the buggy database and the non-buggy database. Then you're looking for a specific thing. If, um, if you're just like, oh, I wonder if there are differences here and then there's a bunch of differences. You're like, I wonder if these differences matter. I mean, you're really just thrashing around at that point. You need to step back and think about what might be causing the problem and, and a specific thing to look for. Um, uh, and so I, I don't mention this in my slide. I actually meant to add it. But on larger websites where you have memcache and maybe a Drupal uh, Redis queue thing running and other things, there's often other places where information is stored that you need to be kind of looking at. And if you have a site like that's aggregating a ton of feeds or whatever, maybe your bugs are some behavior that's changed about the upstream feeds, like they're not keeping as long a history as they used to or something like that. So sometimes under this whole sort of inspecting the database type thing, you also have to inspect other non-database-like things. Um, and you know, it is possible to you know, tell that into memcache and print out cache variables or whatever or I think there's a memcache PHP inspector where you can kind of browse through it and see, see what's in there. And um, you know, there, are ways, there are ways to look into all these things. All these things were made by people who also had to debug them at some point. Um, and uh, so you know, if you, in our open source world, if you have to look into a black box, there's usually some tool out there that somebody made for you to do that. Um, this is a, kind of a plug for the develop module. I think one of the interesting things is you go in the develop module and look at all the different options and stuff that it has. That acts as kind of like a, um, a, you know, a tribal memory of all the things that are hard to debug. <laughs> because if they worked perfectly, they never would have had a special option in the develop module. <laughs> and and uh, I think it's a useful exercise. Just kind of go in there and look through you know, you notice that like a lot of them deal with permission stuff. Like there's a little access permissions block you can turn on that says, okay, for your current user, here's why he can access the node, here's why he can't edit it because of an input filter, and it like lists out all those things, right? And you know, that wouldn't be there if a lot of us hadn't pulled out hairs somewhere along the way. Probably, you know, mostly Dave Reed and Mark Sonnenbaum and them. Um, the user switcher is nice if you have a site with a lot of user roles and permissions, because you can, you can switch to different users quickly and, um, and kind of rerun little tests. Um, I find for some of a lot of the performance-related stuff that um, often kind of a first thing, almost kind of more a first step in vacuuming up the information stage, is I look at the queries that are being generated by some particular feature or page or, or action on the website. And, kind of use that to ground me, like, what's, what's going on here? Is it something that's highly cached? Is it something that should be and isn't? Or, or what's going on? Um, and I also, I don't know, I, I think sometimes maybe I should take this out <laughs> about the develop PHP block, but it's a way to simply run a snippet of PHP inside the Drupal bootstrap environment. And um, so I developed a habit of doing it to look for like particular PHP extensions being installed or, or some other, other types of things. I would even use it like if I had something from a cache table that was a bunch of serialized PHP and I wanted to unserialize it so I could see what it actually was in a nested structure. Like I would paste it into there and so on. Um, but uh, you know, never leave that turned on on development. It's, it's pretty insecure. Um, and there's probably most of the things that, that you use it for, there are other better ways to use it for, to, to, to do it. Like even just running quick snippets of PHP, you can do the, the Drush PHP val um, stuff, and that you can run a, a 
a snippet of PHP inside the Drupal bootstrapped environment that way. It's probably a, a much better way to go about it. Um, usually when I'm debugging, once I narrow it down and I can like say this is definitely a problem in the theme, like if I use this other theme, it's not there. You know, that's usually the point which I can blame someone else and pass it off. So I don't have as much experience, you know, debugging theme and, and, uh, and appearance stuff. Um, but I, I stuck a few things in here that, um, uh, that have bugged me, and I think a couple of them may not apply. Um, this top one about the default template file, and like you have that hierarchy of template files that, that are applied in like greater and greater specificity, and you've skipped one. One doesn't exist somewhere down the chain. Drupal used to like not, not grab the lower one, but I think, I think that started, I think they fixed that even like in the latest Drupal 6. I should probably take that out. Um, and then some of these things are really kind of browsing and web type things in, in, in general, like limits on the number of CSS files in IE and typography and, and appearance problems like that. <clears throat> um, I would make kind of a, a general observation that um, you know, the web with JavaScript and other types of very interactive type things is sort of uh, becoming a very distributed system. And distributed systems are notoriously hard to debug and to replicate problems in. And you know, as we start doing things like having features on Drupal websites that are really just a JavaScript that drag, grabs a bit of JSON somewhere and uses its own template files to display it and, and crazy things like that. Um, there's like, it's like the front end of the system is growing out in complexity and eventually we're going to spend a lot of our time out there chasing bugs as well. Um, I put a separate slide on performance and um, one thing, and, and I, I thought of the slide when um, Eric was giving his talk on performance and site building, um, and particularly like the one thing that he said that really clicked with me was when he said, keep uh, a record of your performance numbers so that you know when they got bad versus when like the customer just decided to have higher standards, you know. Um, and uh, I think, you know, most developers are a little bit leery of any kind of performance debugging. And I think what it comes down to, like the core reason why they have bad experiences debugging performance, is they, they don't have a very good way of replicating the problem. So their experience of performance debugging is change something and hope people quit complaining, right? And so key parts of performance debugging is, you know, when you're debugging normal code, you can replicate the problem by clicking the link and you can you know, test to see if the problem is still there with your eyes, right? So it, you have to realize you can do the same thing in performance, but you replicate the problem by running uh, something that loads a lot of URLs um, or something like LoadStorm that kind of, you can set up that to uh, use a lot of different logged in users at once to log into your site or something like that. That's the equivalent of just clicking the link, right? And then the equivalent of seeing the problem there is sometimes looking at MySQL logs or top or some other metric that's kind of like hidden in the system. Uh, maybe, maybe you need to look a little bit further than just like measuring load times. Um, but uh, um, but the, the, the key point is that the reason why people are leery of that is just because they don't realize that you can get back into the same, de the same debugging mode of, of change something, test, change something, test, you know, undo it, try something else, as long as you can replicate the problem. And what's most frustrating about performance things is people don't know how to do it, and so they're kind of sitting here, throw that over the fence and see if they, they still keep complaining. And um, uh, I recently did some stuff using LoadStorm, which um, has kind of a nice, simple web interface for uh, you know, putting in the URLs you want it to hit and specifying how many concurrent users you can do, logged in users and so on. Um, for a certain amount of stuff, it's, um, it's free. And then, but you can like buy just one month of the service if you need to pound something more and for something like on the order of 30 bucks to 100 bucks or something, depending on how, how much you want. Um, 
And so that's, that's, that's well within like the, you know, the ability if you have to do that for performance testing. Um, uh, I, I really like the, X, the XHProf module uh, in Drupal and as, as a way of like looking at, at specific problems in code. I think um, everybody should like check it out at least once. It's a really great thing put together uh, mostly by Mark Sonnenbaum at Acquia. Um, and essentially you can, you can have a URL, say it goes to a view that's slow, and it gives you a link down at the bottom which automatically gives you like the PHP call tree of which functions took the most time and you can uh, click and browse through that in sort of a JavaScript ajax -y way and focus down upon particular functions that are taking a long time or realize like, hey, why is there no cache get function in here ever or something like that? And it's, it's really slick. It's worth checking out. Um, another thing that I've sometimes done is uh, some of the debugging I do is often figuring out why Varnish isn't caching something and I end up you know, instead of doing my print R in the code that throws out some bit of debugging code, what I do is I do a Drupal set header. And like there's an if then somewhere that says like, if something exists, deliver the cache copy, else, you know, compute the copy and put it in cache, then deliver that copy. And then I can put different things in each one. So I can sit here and reload something and, and confirm whether the second time it's getting it from the cache. Um, and by putting that in the header and then using like the live HTTP headers thing in Firefox, um, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not throwing stuff out on the page. It's a little bit easier. Um, yeah, so I think the takeaway message there is, is that performance debugging can be like any other debugging. You just have to realize that you have to be a little bit more sophisticated in how you replicate things. Um, and this is something I think you will kind of gather if you listen to a lot of war stories about bad bugs. Um, the ones that, that soak up the most ridiculous amounts of time and produce the most immense amounts of frustration are when you have two components of the system that you are each quote unquote bug free, but somehow working together, they don't work right. And what happens here is you're trying to, to do the divide and conquer, right? You're trying to split this into two different things and the bug is somehow like straddling where you're trying to cut it, right? And it, and it won't get in there. And um, so a lot, of, a lot of these deal with ex, uh, external service requests or buggy APIs or just misusing the API because you didn't read the API very much, the API specification very much, or it wasn't documented at all and that type of thing. I think a pattern is that more and more of the websites I, I work on seem to be using a lot of external services. And, um, and that's like a ripe area for hard to reproduce bugs because sometimes you can't control the other end and sort of replicate it over and over again. So that can be very frustrating. Theme and module interactions are kind of a classic one. Another classic one is module weights. You have something where one hook kind of overwrites what another hook was supposed to do, and if you like swap the order that the hooks are run in, then, then it works right. And that, that can be very tedious to uh, track down. Um, there is, a, let's see, there is a develop module thing, again, that will show you all the weights on, the, mod, on the, the modules page that all the modules have, so sometimes that can help you in checking things out and adjusting the weights up or down to kind of do little tests. Um, Another kind of performance related thing that, that is an interaction type bug is something that looks completely innocuous that someone does, clears all the caches, and causes this other thing to become unreasonably slow or cause some big problem, right? So, so, so people are saying that, oh, you know, everyone comes in the morning and loads their calendars and, and then it seems to crash and you're trying to figure out, well, why aren't those all crashed or whatever, and it's like actually one person who comes in every morning, like, you know, changes something on their calendar, like adds an appointment if they have it or whatever. And, and it's that one little innocuous, you know, 0.1% of the traffic is doing something that, that through the interaction of caches between different parts of the system, you know, causes an effect to, to spread you hadn't expected.
Um, when I've given this talk a bunch of times, and kind of as I did it, I would like look and, and get various books on debugging and so on. If you uh, most of the books that are supposedly about debugging aren't actually that that good. A lot of them are about just good development practices, and and they're they're pretty good, but they're not about debugging really. And this one's sort of a very um, uh, informal, like like almost cheesy type book. Like it's, it's it's got a lot of cartoon pictures in it, and it's written in a very anecdotal way. But it's it's actually one of the best ones, I think. And and it it kind of distills down that hypothesis and test thing, it kind of breaks it down a little bit differently into these nine rules or whatever. It's a relatively cheap book. Um, so it's like, I don't know, like 20 bucks or something on Amazon, or maybe 30. Um, whereas a lot of the other books that I've purchased on, on this are like, you know, sort of computer science type textbooks, which cost $110 and so on. And when I get into them, like, they're not really that useful. They have like academic ideas about automatically finding bugs and stuff like that. Um, and if you look down through these, there's, you know, the understand the system is sort of the hypothesis thing. Make it fail is being able to replicate. Um, you know, it has quit thinking and look, the whole divide and conquer thing, and then the changing only one thing at a time, and then undoing it, and keeping an audit trail so you know what you've done. That's sort of like keeping track of the system and making sure you're always looking on at a fresh thing. That's where I got the phrase, check the plug from, for doing like the, the, the cheap tests. And I think the final one, you know, if you didn't fix it, it ain't fixed, is it's kind of key. Like if you just clear the cache and people quit complaining, you probably didn't fix a bug. Something's gonna cause the cache to get out of sync again and people will be complaining again at some point. Um, at the end of a debugging process, you should really sort of understand why the code put what it did on the screen. And if you don't really understand that, then you probably didn't fully undo it and make it, make it right. Um, uh, so normally I bring a couple copies of this book and give them out, and my copies are sitting on my desk at home, unfortunately. But, um, uh, but I will send you a copy of that book if you send me a story of a really interesting bug hunt in Drupal, especially if I can use it in the talk. Like, as an example of how like different things were checked that turned out to be wrong, and how you got on the right path and found and found it, um, I'm kind of collecting such anecdotes to see if I can you know put together some more interesting material. And uh, so, kind of the takeaway points here are you know there's a strategy to coming up with the right guesses and tests, and that's more important than you know, being blazing fast in VI or knowing having X debug set up or, or any other trick is, is sort of the thought process. Um, the, if you've been working on a bug for more than a day, it's probably a weird interaction bug between two things that by themselves are bug free. And, and at some point you realize, hey, I've been working on this for a while, I should probably be thinking about things talking to each other or something like that or API type stuff. And finally, if you just sort of consciously th remember that debugging is sort of a different process and pay attention to how you do it, you'll get, you'll get better at it very quickly. I think a lot of people don't get better at it because they don't really view it as, they, for, they don't really think of it as any different than like having bad traffic on the way to work. It's like, you know, a bunch of stuff happened that stopped me from writing code today. Um, but, <coughs> If that stuff was that you were trying to debug some problem, and you remember that, and you think of particular ways to debug problems, then you'll be able to get through those things much quicker. It's, um, it's not hard to learn. It is hard to teach, though. I mean, you can't just give someone a list of steps, you know, those, that little hypothesized test and repeat loop or whatever. Like, it isn't a computer program you can just follow. Um, but you, can, but you definitely can get better at it. I mean, I've seen many people, I've gotten much better at it myself just from thinking about it. And um, you know, if you work with other programmers, you know, you'll realize as a group you get better at it. Um, so it's, it's definitely something that you can save a lot of hours out of your week with. Um, also, I put down a uh, link to the camp survey here that goes to a web forum where they're like asking for feedback on all sorts of various things. So, at some point today, you should 
get around to that. Um, are there any questions, particularly any like stories of interesting bugs? Yes. The question is, is really good. What do you do at this point if you find a core Drupal 6 bug? <coughs> do you just fix it locally and move on? I think the question is, is no, definitely not for Drupal 6. You can report bugs for Drupal 6, that people will look at them and fix them. That is like actively being supported. I would say that even for, even if for some reason you have a Drupal 4.7 site that for some reason will never be migrated or whatever. They exist out there, um, hundreds of them, maybe more. <laughs> um, and you find something in it, and you figure, oh, I can fix this. It's actually in Drupal core or whatever. You should at least in some way get that on Drupal.org or, or on the web in general, that you did that with the patch file. Um, because not only will it help other people, but um, you may at least get some feedback that says, like, no, actually, that isn't a bug. That's an option you didn't know about and you need to change somewhere else or something like that. So I would, even for you know, relatively, Drupal 6 is, is supported right now, but even for unsupported versions of Drupal, I would, I would very much avoid ever like, kind of making changes in you know, a box you know, in a basement without communication out there. At least throw it over the fence and see if, a couple of weeks later, like someone, you know, they'll mark that issue as won't fix because it applies to the wrong version. And then, like, sometime down the road, someone may post a comment that says, like, yeah, this always used to happen on Drupal 7, and what you do is this, you know, or something like that, right? Um, so I, I would definitely not give up the communication with the development community aspect of it. I think, um, unless you're in the process of ripping all the data about that, out of that and are about to shut it down, then maybe. <laughs> um, but yeah, Drupal 6 is still supported and having you know, regular releases and everything. And um, uh, there are people starting new sites on Drupal 6 all the time, which might not be a good idea in some cases, but it's happening. <coughs> Yeah. So when it changed, or when it changed, you mentioned was uh, Queen Anne and the CSS with JavaScript. So why couldn't you have to worry about it propagating into the sometimes that arbitrary amount of minutes you may have lost? Right. What I think you need to do is uh, just put the question mark and then the version number of your tool set and the JavaScript file. That usually will force you to route it and put that as a different file over there. So that way you don't have to change the file. Yeah, that, that was a good tip. What he was saying is that if you're, um, if, if you're uh, tracking down CSS and, and, and JavaScript problems and you're trying to figure out if their old versions are being improperly cached on the CDN, one thing you can do is just add a URL query of, of some type to, to the in that. So you do like a question mark, you know, V equals and some version number or something like that. And what that'll do is it'll cause the CDN to see that as a new file and not cache it. And then it will go through back to your Drupal site. And you'll be getting this, the, the version from the Drupal site. And then, you know, and, then, and then you can see if the problem is still there. And then if it is still there, I would you know, further do the test of actually download the two files to the desktop and compare them with diff and say, yes, you know, if I go just straight to the CDN for you know, uh, views underscore whatever dot CSS, I get this. And if I pull it off my Drupal site, I get that. So I know that's why the problem is. Um, another similar uh, thing is sometimes people mess around with their host file to make it take the CDN um, uh, IP and just send it back to their development thing. Um, that's one of those changes that people tend to do and leave on and, and forget, <laughs> which uh, can cannot be good. Um, so yeah, that's a that's a very good that's a very good tip. Anyone else? 
I will you know, be around for another hour or so. If you have any ideas, come and tell me or you know, send me Twitter or email or whatever. I do kind of you know, collect debugging nightmare stories. So yes? What's your Twitter account? It's um, at RobGR. Let me see if it's on the next slide. No, I'll just go back to the first one. There it is. So I think there, there is a lot of, of kind of uh, mental benefit in, in trading stories. And if you work with a team of, of programmers, you, you should sort of trade those, those stories. And, um, and also trade them with the people who aren't actually programmers, like those people who talk to the customers who collect that initial bug report and stuff like that. Because having sm one of the points I made is that having smart people there can sometimes really save you a lot of time. I mean, it's hard to tell how much, but you know, I, I suspect certain people I've worked with were uh, probably you know, were worth several developers just in the fact that they were very kind of meticulous without overburdening the customer or pissing them off, and we're really good at that. All right, thanks. I will be around. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Astris. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Astris, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astrospace systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astris or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astris. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a thing that 
really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how Cloud Stack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of Cloud Stack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack.